Revelation chapter number 19. Now, uh, we're going to start again tonight in verse number 10 because last week we, we, uh, we lost some of the video sound. We are having problems with things, and so I told him I'd pick up there and start over again in the passage tonight. Verse number 10, he says, And I fell at his feet, talking about the angel. And by the way, Revelation 19, the, the issue here is we're getting down to the... Uh, second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, his second coming back to the earth. And the whole passage here is anticipating that. And uh, you get down to where we are in verse number 10 and 11, and you're going to actually get to it. Uh, we've tried to come up to the second advent twice now, or, or a time or two. Chapter 16, we got right up to Armageddon. Uh, if you look back in chapter number 16 and remind yourself of it, uh, in chapter 16, verse number 15, or 14 rather, you're coming through the, the, the seven vials of the wrath of God in chapter 16, those last plagues and, and vials of God's wrath that are going to be poured out on the planet. And as, we, as you come up to that, you're coming down through them. You come in verse 14 to the, to the, to, in the sixth vial. Uh, they, chapter 16, verse 14, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And that battle of the great day of God Almighty, we're going to read about it in Revelation chapter 19. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked. And uh, they see his shame. And he gathered them together into, into, one, into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And when you, you're gathered up to, to come to Armageddon and get ready to go into Armageddon, and then he stops. And instead of going in, you, you, you see this seventh vial is poured out uh, on the air, and you see the destruction following that of Babylon, the great city Babylon. And in chapter 17 and 18, you see the destruction of Babylon, the great religious and political center that, that, uh, that, that covers up the earth uh, in, at this time, and <clears throat> the, the religion of the Antichrist, and the political center that, that's, that, and economic uh, interests that are involved around it. And that they're destroyed. And it's like he says, okay, we're going to go over here to the great day of God. And we'll wait just a minute. Before we get there, there's something else you need to look at. And then he says, look back here just before we get there at the destruction of the city and Babylon and the system. And then you get in chapter 19, and he takes us up into heaven. And we see the hallelujahs in, in Revelation 19, verse 1, uh, 1 to 6 there, where they, they're anticipating him coming. And verse 6, they say, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And then you see the, the, the bride is made ready for the, for the, 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 the return of, uh, of the Lord. And the bride will be Israel on the earth. And the marriage supper and the marriage and all doesn't take place in heaven. We saw it all takes place on the earth down here. And uh, the bride is made ready for the second coming. And the, so the groom is going to come now to the bride and be received by her. And we're actually down now. There isn't any more at waiting and, and postponing. Now we're down to the passage that's going to describe, and it's amazingly brief because uh, there's been you know, there's so much that goes on in it. But uh, we're down now to the point where Christ actually comes back to the earth to destroy his enemies. And the great day and the great battle of, of the day of God Almighty is to be executed. And that's the passage before us. It starts in verse 10 where John says, I fell at his feet to worship him, talking about the angel that was showing these things to him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have, have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Uh, John is so overwhelmed, evidently, by what he sees and by the prospect of what's coming that he, he mistakenly falls down and worships the, uh, the angel and falls down at his feet because of the great message that he's gotten. The, the angel comes as the, as, the, as the messenger of God. And so John falls and worships him, and the angel immediately says, No, don't worship me. The only person you worship is God. Any time, any political, any, any religious leader or any preacher or anybody that pr proclaims or professes to, to, to stand in the place of God and be the spokesman for God and be the, be the one who is, is God's representative on the earth, and that person allows another person to worship them, you know they're phony. You know they're a fake. You know they're in it for the worship and not for truth. 
the angel, and again, John makes this mistake in chapter 22, and immediately the angel stops him. The only person that's ever to be worshipped on this planet is God Almighty. And no one else is worthy of worship. And when Jesus Christ, Thomas bowed down before the Lord Jesus Christ and said, my Lord, worshipped him and said, my Lord and my God, Jesus Christ didn't rebuke him because he knew that he was due the worship Thomas was giving him. But Jesus isn't like you are. The Lord Jesus Christ is God and manifest in human flesh. He is God himself. So he was worthy of the worship. But you and I aren't. Even an angel will not allow men to worship him, but rather says, you worship God. So if you see some holy man uh, calling himself a holy man or a guru or a preacher or a priest or a pope or any other religious leader who allows people to worship them, you know what you've got. You've got a blasphemous counterfeit of the truth because the truth and someone speaking the truth would stop it and not allow it to go on. And the reason that he says that not to do it, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, worship God because he's coming. And the testimony of Jesus, not, not, it's not the testimony of the angel where the prophecy comes from. The prophecy that John is, is so overwhelmed by doesn't come from the angel. He's just the messenger and the go-between. The testimony is that which comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the testimony of, 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 uh, of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Of course, we're dealing with the prophetic program here. Uh, hold your hand here and come back with me to Daniel chapter number 2. The goal of all of the prophetic program is identified for you in Daniel chapter 2 in prospect. It's going to be realized in Revelation chapter 11. Uh, the goal of prophecy, the thing that prophecy is moving toward and uh, seizes its goal is Daniel chapter 2, verse number 44. Daniel, in Daniel 2, Daniel is interpreting the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had of this great image uh, of this man whose head was gold and his, his, his shoulders were, were silver and his belly was, was brass and his legs were, were iron and his feet are iron and clay. And he represents the Gentile rulership, the times of the Gentiles, when God gives the, the government of this planet into the hands of the Gentiles. But he says that that, that, that Gentile dominion in the earth is going to end. And the way it ends is Nebuchadnezzar sees a great stone cut without hands, a stone that God made in sins, come down and hit that image on its feet and completely destroyed the image. And then that big rock grows into a great mountain. And in, in interpreting that, that, that vision, he interprets what that stone that destroys the, the image is and what the mountain that it grows into is. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up, what? A kingdom. Now I ask the question, if the God of heaven set up a kingdom, what would you call it? Well, you could call it the kingdom of God because the God of heaven set it up, right? But you could also call it the kingdom of heaven, for it's the God of heaven that set it up. Where does he set it up? He sets it up on the earth. Deuteronomy chapter 11 says it'll be as the days of heaven upon the earth. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven have the will of God executed on the earth as it is in the heavens. Uh, it's the kingdom of heaven, but it's the kingdom of God. In this day, the goal that prophecy go looks toward and is moving toward when it's in operation is, is that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. It's not a temporary thing. It's not something that's already been here, and it's just working in the hearts of men all around the world today. Daniel chapter number 2 fixes forever, without any question to anybody that believes the words on the page in a Bible, fixes clearly the premillennial system of, of Bible interpretation as the prophetic system of study.
premillennialism is that Jesus Christ is literally going to come back to this earth, personally set up a literal, physical, visible Davidic kingdom on this planet with Jerusalem as the head, Israel as the head of the nations, and his authority is going to be executed around this planet through the instrumentality of that kingdom given to the nation Israel. Premillennial, he comes back before the kingdom is set up. Now the popular view of religion is what's called amillennialism or postmillennialism. That is, that the kingdom is already here. Well, you know, it's like the lady down south heard a young seminarian preach one time about Revelation 20 and how that when Christ comes back, he binds Satan in the bottomless pit, puts him in a chain, binds him in the bottomless pit so he can't deceive the nations anymore, and then Christ rules and reigns for a thousand years. And the, the amillennial interpretation of that is that Christ comes, you know, that, that Christ coming is the gospel. When the gospel comes into your town, it binds Satan and he's put away. And then Christ reigns in the hearts of men. And as she went out the door, she said to her friend, she says, well, you know, you know, Mary Jane said, I, I don't know about that young seminarian there. I don't know about this stuff about the devil being bound. If Satan's bound today, he sure do have a long chain. <laughs> and you know, that's a fact. That's a fact. And you, just your practical experience in life tells you that the God of this world is not God Almighty, the God of the Bible. Satan isn't bound yet. He does deceive the nations yet. And even with the going forth of the gospel today, he still deceives. In fact, it's, he's the God of this world who blinds the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ shine unto them. So in the dispensation of grace, he, he, he isn't bound. Now the reason for amillennialism and where it came from is a failure to understand that the kingdom that Christ preached and that the apostles preached when he was on earth and in the early Acts was a literal, physical, visible, earthly Davidic kingdom, a real kingdom like the prophet said was going to come, that their hope was not mistaken, their hope was right, and that the reason that kingdom hasn't come isn't because Christ didn't offer it or it wasn't preached or it wasn't real or they misunderstood the nature of it. The reason it hasn't come is that God has interrupted that kingdom program, set that program aside, and is today doing something entirely different. You see, it's in prophecy where it's God's purpose to reconcile and restore the governments of this earth back under his authority. God today in the dispensation of grace is not seeking to restore the governments of this planet back under his authority. And the business of the church of Jesus Christ and the business of the members of the body of Christ is not to be as members of the body of Christ out trying to coerce the government into doing what you want it to do. That isn't our business today. Our business is to preach the truth of the gospel of the grace of God and put the word of God in the hearts of men so that men as, as godly men and women will go out and do things that are right and make wise decisions and live godly in a world and that will influence the government and whatever else. And it may, it may influence them to hate you and to pass laws against you. But folks, the... The, uh, the, the responsibility of members of the body of Christ, apart from being good citizens and active participants in your government as, as, as best you're able to do it, the, the greatest thing you do for your country and your government is not try, try to go out and be a dominion theologian or, or a kingdom now bunch who's trying to make out like the kingdom is now and you can bring in the kingdom and, and bind the devil and throw him out today. You're whistling in the wind. That isn't what God's doing today. And you've never been big enough a day in your life, and you never will be, to make God do something he isn't doing. What God's doing today is forming the church, the body of Christ. And what we need to be doing is get busy and be active in finding out about that. Now, in, in Revelation chapter 19, when he comes back to the earth in this passage, he's going to come back to set up that kingdom, and the goal of prophecy is going to be fulfilled. This passage is talking about that stone coming back and going to destroy the, uh, uh, the kingdoms of this world. You look down in verse number 16. And he says, He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's who he is and how he comes back. Now let's, read it. Let, let's study the, the coming. It starts in verse number 11. 
And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. You notice he comes back on a, on a white horse. Now somebody says, well, do you really believe he's going to ride a white horse? Well, the verse says he is, and I don't know any reason not to believe what God says about it because I figure God knows more about it than you're in my speculation about it. You say, well, are there horses in heaven? Well, you know, you didn't even have to ask that question. 2 Kings chapter 2, um, 2 Kings chapter 6, you see Elisha is carried up and, and, and there's a chariot and horses of fire come and get him. In the spirit world, the chariots and the horses, and they carry him away. Elisha uh, has, has asked God to open the eyes of his servants that he can see out on the hills there, there and, he, and he sees out there the horsemen and the chariots of Israel and the angelic world and the spirit world and he sees horses and, uh, and chariots and the horse's flesh is, is, is the flesh of the flame of fire. You say, well, is that real? Yeah, it's real. It's just not carbon-14. <laughs> so it's in, it's, in, it's in the spirit world, in the angelic creation. And we have a tendency, see, we're, you know, we're, we're so materialistic that we think that if something, if you can't feel it and touch it and thump it and make it make a noise, that it isn't real. But you know it's real. You know there are a lot of things you can't touch, feel, see, or sense with your natural senses that are just as real as you are. You know that you could put on that, plat, that, that table right there a television, run up the rabbit ears, turn that thing on, tune it to channel 257, 9, 11, uh, 15, 20, 55, 50, 66, whatever else, 42, 26, 37, hike. <laughs> Tune it to whatever you want to, wherever, wherever there's a station, and, and what happens? Sound and pictures show up. Well, where'd they come from? They come out of the air. They're right there. I don't even try to catch one. I can't get it. Why? You gotta have the right kind of receiver. You gotta have a television. Then you gotta tune it to the right channel. And then you know what? Boop, there they are, pictures and sound. Pull them right out of the air. There, you don't feel them, you don't sense them, you don't hear them, you can't touch them, you can't get them, except that, well, you've got the right receiver. There it is, the Word of God. It tells you what's out there. You know, some dumb American, educated by, beyond his capacity to stand it, uh, you know, he's got more degrees than he's got temperature, but hadn't got any common sense, come along and say, well, it can't be real. And then the, the, you know, the dumb nut goes out and getting in, get in, in his car, flips on the radio, and rides off thinking he really puts you in your place. You know, it didn't make a lick of sense. But then to him it never will. You know, wise in his own eyes. But uh, for you, you know, you just say, well, hmm, we got that. We got it. So what you've got here is, is, is Christ comes on this white horse. Now, it's, it's real. It's not fake and phony. He's, he's going to come on this white charger. Heaven opens, and out he comes. And he's leading the armies of heaven. Now there's another guy with a white horse in chapter number 6 of Revelation. And you don't want to mistake the two. The one in Revelation chapter 6 verse number 2, I saw him to hold a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now un unfortunately, uh, this guy here is the Antichrist. But many of the commentaries, in fact, most major commentaries, identify the rider of the white horse in chapter 2 as the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the ways you can, you can check a commentary on the book of Revelation as to how fundamental and sound it is is by checking this passage right here. Uh, only a premillennialist, and not all of them, by the way, but only a premillennialist understands that this is not Jesus Christ. The average commentary identifies this guy here as Christ. The greatest imitator in, the, in, in all the world is Satan. And this guy right here is the great imitator of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's the, the, the Antichrist. Now you notice it says that he, he's on a white horse, but it says he has a bow. Well, if you look over in Revelation 19, there's, the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't have a bow. What's he got? He's got a sword. Uh, in Revelation 6, it says he's got a crown was upon his head. Well, over there in, in, uh, in Revelation chapter 19, he's got many Verse 12, it says, many crowns on his head. And in, uh, in, in Revelation 6, the guy goes forth conquering and to conquer, and you go on down through there, and it's just judgment, wrath, and destruction, and death and hell following him. Uh, over in Revelation 19, it's the armies of God following the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So it's, it's satanic counterfeit first. Now the real thing's showing up. So in chapter 19, we've got the real thing. Uh, he, he's on earth. Uh, and and uh, in fact, the one in 19 is coming from heaven. The one in chapter 6 is on the earth. So you know it's, they're, they're not the same. You notice, uh, you know for sure who it is in chapter 11, verse number, uh, chapter 9, 19, verse 11, because it tells you his name. He's called faithful and true. Now that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you don't have to, have to wonder who it is, uh, but because he tells you who it is. Uh, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now, judgment and war, that's the issue in the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's attitude toward the world today is grace and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Every epistle Paul writes, he starts by saying grace to you and peace from God the Father and from, our, from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is not just simply a, 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 a nice way to say hello, dear so-and-so. That isn't what he's doing. When Paul says grace to you and peace, he is not simply expressing the Jewish and the Greek salutation. Now that's where the most commentaries teach that. But that isn't what he's doing. Grace is the opposite of judgment, and peace is the opposite of war. And when Paul addresses his letters, he, he starts them out, every one of them, by saying grace and peace from God the Father and from his rejected, exiled Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He starts his letters out by expressing to you the official attitude of God himself toward the world today. And God's attitude toward the world today is that God was in Christ reconciling the world and himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And in every one of Paul's epistles, when he starts out, that's what he's doing. He's not just, you know, got a, a sweet Jewish and Greek combination of a way to say hello. He's giving you an understanding. If you understand what's going on in Scripture, he's giving you a, 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 an introduction to grace and to God's attitude toward the world today. Now, all that's going to change. And here's where it changes. Because there isn't any more grace, there isn't any more peace. Now, it's judgment and war. The second advent, the day of vengeance of God is at hand. And you begin reading it in verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he, had, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed with fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nation. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming back to set up the kingdom. And on his way, the day of vengeance and wrath of Almighty God is going to be executed on his enemies. We call that the day of the Lord the day when the Lord alone is exalted. And in fact, in prophecy, it's called the great and notable day of the Lord. Now, if you go back to verse 12 and you come down through there, his eyes was the flame of fire. That'll be like back in chapter number 1 when we saw him back there uh, d described in the vision when John first saw him. And on his head were many crowns. Uh, he's coming, folks, to reign, to fulfill his reign as king. That reign was to begin, that, 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 that uh, uh, program that began to be fulfilled at Pentecost. It's been interrupted today in the dispensation of grace. Finally, it's going to be finished at this time here. And he's going to put them under his feet uh, and reign over them. His eyes were a flame of fire and, on, and, and his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now, in the passage here, he's actually given four names. He's called Faithful. He's called True. Verse 13, his name is called the Word of God. 
And in verse 16, he's got a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then now he's also going to have a fifth name that nobody knows but he himself. So when he comes back, he's not only going to be faithful and true and the Word of God and King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's how he's been pro proclaimed in prophecy. But he's even going to have a new name associated with his reign in the kingdom over here. And uh, that, that, that thing is described back in chapter 3. We've already seen this. Uh, Yeah, I guess that's the one I was looking for. He, uh, Revelation 3.12, he, he that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven for, uh, for my God, and I will write upon him my new name. In other words, he's going to take that new name that's given to him and give it to the overcomers. Uh, chapter 2, verse number 17. He that, that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth it. And this new name, uh, you know, when God, when God starts something, uh, you know, when when, when, when John the Baptist came on the scene and introduced the kingdom program, and that began with the kingdom program. Christ took Peter, James, and John, the head of the twelve, and, and his other associates, that, that little uh, triumphant of guys that sort of stood out. Uh, I love what J. Vernon McGee used to say about those guys. People say well, Peter, James, and John were the special three that the Lord really loved and did all this with. Uh, McGee said they were, they were the three dumbest guys he had and took a lot of special tutelage <laughs> to, to keep them up with everybody else. Now, that's probably a lot of truth in that. But those three guys are the only three people among the twelve that the Lord gave surnames to. He actually renamed them, gave them new names. Peter was Simon Barjona's new name given by the Lord. When he starts something new, when, when Paul came, when the dispensation of grace came along, Saul, he's Saul of Tarsus. Saul gets saved, and in the pages of Scripture, his other name, Paul, takes over. And uh, short, he, you, you see it introduced the first time in Acts 13, and shortly thereafter, the name Saul falls away, and the new name, Paul, comes on the scene. So when Christ comes back the second time to establish the new covenant and inaugurate the new covenant with Israel, there's a new name associated with it. And it says that no man knows what that name is. And that's more than just not being able to say the name is Alex or Bill or Roy or, or Mel or something. It's that nobody really understands all there is involved in who he is. And he's going to make it known. And in that new covenant out there, he's going to begin to expound and to do what he did for the disciples in his post-resurrection ministry where he opened their eyes that they might understand the scriptures. He's going to once again be, begin to proclaim all that he is and all that he's won and all that he's accomplished through the new covenant that he's established with them. So he has a new name, even, uh, e even when he comes back. Now verse 13, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now notice carefully, he comes out of heaven, and the armies of heaven come with him. Who is that? Come over to chapter 12. The armies in heaven come with him. The armies in heaven are the angels, the angelic host, the angelic armies uh, come out of heaven with him. Chapter 12, verse number 7, there was war in heaven. 
Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And folks, the Michael and his angels fight against Satan and his angels in the war in heaven. And Michael is the commander in chief of the armies of heaven and the armies of God throw out the armies of the adversary into the earth. And those armies of God take up the positions up there and they, they consolidate the government of the heavens. So much so that when you come down to verse number uh, 10 in Revelation 12, he says, And I heard a loud voice uh, saying in heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. <laughs> the kingdom of God begins to be established in the government in the heavens. Satan is cast down to the earth. And those people that dwell in heavens, verse 12, say, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. All that government in the heaven is purged of the adversaries and the rebels, and they're cast down to the earth. And the angels of God and the armies of God go up and take up the bivouac there and, 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 and order the thing. You know who was put into those positions of governmental authority in the heavens that the adversary is thrown out? Well, you're going to be there. And I'm going to be there. And all the other members of the body of Christ are going to be there. And folks, the functioning that you carry on now, the understanding that you gain, and the edification capacity that you build into your soul right now as a child of God on planet Earth, learning and studying and being faithful to the truth of God and walking in the Spirit of God and understanding what God's doing, what we're doing down here is going to have an impact out there. If Paul's epistles mean what they say and say what they mean, and there's no doubt in my mind that they do, then the capacity and the measure of every part of the body of Christ, the capacity that you build up in your soul right now, and you know, we're not talking about how much, how much wood, stay and, wood, hay, and stubble you build up, and what kind of show, what kind of activities, and what kind of performing you do. We're talking about the quality of God's work in your heart. And all those things will be reviewed. And God the Father will have the joy and the privilege of having you stand before him, having you as a member of the body of Christ being presented to him by God the Son there in the third heaven. When, the, when we come with Christ to be presented before the Father, when he comes with all of his saints, 1 Thessalonians 3.13 talks about, we go up at the rapture to the judgment seat of Christ and then to be presented to God the Father in the heavens. And God the Father will take you and match you with a function in the government of the heavens where you'll live and function up to the full extent of your capacity in every way. Haven't you always wanted to live up to your full potential? Haven't you always wanted to be able to just function fully and completely and not be hampered and not be in over your head? It's going to be a wonderful day. Then those armies in heaven aren't going to be needed anymore, and they're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ back down to the planet. Matthew 25, verse 31 says, when the, when, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory with all the holy angels with Him. So when He comes back, the armies of heaven come with Him. And they come out of heaven, and He's on a white horse leading them. And they're on white horses. And they're in white linens, fine and clean when they, when they come out of heaven. But notice what happens to them. Verse 13, he is clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. He's no longer clean and white. What's happened? Verse 15, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He's going to set up his kingdom. He treadeth for, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. You know what you do in a winepress? You get in there and you, you stomp around, and you make a mess, and you stomp... You know what happens when you stomp on stuff and it begins to squish out? Gets all up over everybody. I was out in California back in February, the Bible conference out there. And I stay with, with a family that's about a 10-minute walk from the, the, the meeting hall. 
and my custom is to, to leave, and instead of ride, I, I enjoy walking. It's a beautiful weather, and it's a nice, wonderful uh, walk. People don't walk a lot in California. They look at you like you're nuts when you're walking down the side of the road, you know? And like, who let you out? <laughs> uh, the door of the booby hatch is open or something, you know? But we like to walk, and we were walking up there, and it had rained. And there was a, we, we were going across the bridge, and the bridge, there, there's this big, it's about probably twice at least, if not three times, Mel will have to correct me, as wide as this room is. And usually it's dry, but in the, it had torrential rains and it's full. And people, they actually had guards on the bridge because people were getting on there, jumping in, and floating out to the, the Pacific Ocean on inner tubes. You know, you got to be nuts, man. The water's, you know, it's white water rapids, man. Just get on here and have fun. You know, woo -woo. <laughs> Land of fruit and nuts, man. You know, it's, it's just, let it all hang out. So out away, they, away they go, you know. And they got people down there guarding the thing, and, and a guy had gotten in past them, and they, they were, he was coming down, they had the fire department with a net going to catch him, you know. And I'm thinking, man, all this government money going on here, tax money and all this stuff, just let the little guy alone and go on, you know. Somebody said, well, he might drown. Well, he jumped in. I mean, good night, man. You know, I, I couldn't, but anyway, you know, they, they're going to they're gonna protect you whether you want it or not. So uh, we, walk, we got by all that, and we're going on down, and I'm, here comes this, this truck. And we're walking on the sidewalk and going across the bridge. Nowhere to go now. You know, there's the bridge and then over in the river. And there's about like where Mel is, there's this big water pocket, mud hole. And I'm looking at that truck, and I'm looking at that water hole, and I got the idea that about the time I get to about where that, I, I can get almost to that water hole and that truck's going to be there. There wasn't much way to get past it before he got there. And I could have stood where I was, and if he'd have run through it, I'd have got wet. Now, you, you ever had that experience? You don't know what to do. You can't jump over because it's just the river out there. You can't go back because there's a fire truck back there hollering at everybody to go on, go on, go on. And you're facing the mud hole and the splash is coming. And fortunately, just thank goodness, fortunately what happened is that the guy went around. He saw what he was going to do and he missed it. And gee, was I grateful. Well, what's happening here is that kind of a thing, the splash. His vesture gets dipped in blood. He comes out, starts out clean and white. Before the trip's over, he's blood from head to foot. Come with me to chapter 14. Chapter number 14. Verse number... 19. The angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered in the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Same passage. And the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horse's bridle, by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. That's something a little over a hundred and eighty miles. For the that that's longer than the land mass of Israel is. Over a territory larger than modern day Israel. They're going to go out there and judge and wrath. Come with me to Isaiah, 30, uh, Isaiah 63. There's going to be judgment and wrath and, and destruction. He's literally going to be squashing people in the wine press of the wrath of God coming along and judging them, and the blood is going to squirt up as high as a horse's bridle. That's going to be a gory mess. You know that? You know what that is? That's something you don't want to be a part of. That's the wine press of the wrath and vengeance of God against the satanic policy of evil that's going to be gathered together there at the Battle of Armageddon. Isaiah 63 speaks about that time period. 
The passage talks about the Armageddon that we're reading over here in the land of Israel in Revelation 19. And the question is asked, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. Answer, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Question, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garment like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Answer, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garment, and I will stain all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. Boy, you know, that's something. That runs cold chills up and down my spine, I think about that. That's a day when Jesus Christ comes back out of heaven down here to destroy and pour out his wrath and the day of vengeance is in his heart. Come over to Isaiah 34. Isaiah chapter number 34. You see there in Isaiah 63 where he talks about the blood is sprinkled on him. It's splattered up on him. And it gets on him to the extent that it, that it just completely covers him. Isaiah 34. By the way, he came from Edom and Bozrah, that's south of the Dead Sea. When Christ comes back, he starts out up in Damascus area, up north of, of Israel. And he comes down the Mediterranean coast, down through uh, uh, Israel, on the, uh, Israel goes down through the Gaza Strip, goes down into Sin the Sinaitic Peninsula down here, and then he gets down to Mount Sinai and he turns around. All that way, this thing takes two days to take to to uh, to to, to uh, complete. And it's judgment and war and wrath and the wine press of the wrath of Almighty God, the day of vengeance. And he comes down that, that, that Mediterranean coast, down into Sinai, and then begins to come up from Sinai, up what's called in Numbers the King's Highway, comes up from Sinai, up toward the Dead Sea. Bozra, Edom, Idumea is all south of the Dead Sea. Comes around the eastern side of the Dead Sea, up to the top of the Dead Sea, and crosses the Jordan River from the east, going west into Jerusalem over to Mount, the Mount of Olives. It's not until he gets to the Mount of Olives that he ever gets off that horse. And the first time his feet touch the ground is on the Mount of Olives from, the, from where the last time his feet touched the ground were. Acts 1, he ascends up off the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14, he comes back to the Mount of Olives. But he doesn't just float down out of heaven to the Mount of Olives. He spent a long time in the wine press of the vengeance of God and the wrath of God before he gets there. Isaiah 34 is describing, Isaiah 63 describes him coming back from the battle and he's just covered with the blood. Isaiah 34 describes a similar scene. It says, Come near, ye nations, to hear and hearken, ye people, let the earth hear and all that there is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain shall also, also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as a leaf falleth off the vine, and a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Revelation 12. Revelation 12 is, will match verse 4 and 5 there. Where the host of heaven, the angels up there, are cast down. His sword is bathed in the heavens, and the war there. Behold, he says, verse 5, it my sword shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. 
It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats and the fat of kidneys and of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice and bows and a great sacrifice in the land of Edomi. And he goes on down to describe how that land is literally becomes a burning inferno. We're talking about when Jesus comes back, folks. We're talking about him coming back in wrath and in vengeance. Verse 8 says, For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Come with me to Zechariah chapter number 14. Zechariah chapter number 14. Find Zechariah myself. Here the page is all turned up. Zechariah 14, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. For the, then, then, after the persecution has come on Jerusalem, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Hold your hand there and come back to Isaiah 31. Notice how he goes forth. Isaiah 31. He's going to go forth to defend Jerusalem. Isaiah 31, verse 4 and 5. Hang on to Zechariah now. Isaiah 31, verse 4 and 5. For thus saith the Lord, God, hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as a lion and a young lion roareth on his prey when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice nor abase himself with the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. He just comes down, flying down to, as birds flying. So will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also he will deliver it, and passing over he will preserve it. He comes back in an airborne, what do you want to call it? Vehicle. It's called a white horse. And whatever it is, when it shows up, Whatever that's describing in the angelic world, he comes back and he comes over this and does all this flying over and defends Jerusalem as in the day of battle. That means you go back in the book of Joshua and you see what's going on back in the book of Joshua in the day of, of battle and you have pictures and dress rehearsals of what that day is going to be like. Those Jews in that land over there, when he comes back, are going to be able to go back into their Old Testaments and see literally the events unfolding before their eyes. Now go back to Zechariah 14 and notice verse number 4. After he's gone forth and flown over them and done all of that and has come back up the king's highway and crosses the Jordan River, he'll cross Jordan right where Israel crossed it. And they put those 12 monument stones in the Jordan River. They put them there to mark the spot where Messiah would come again. Where John the Baptist baptized the Lord Jesus Christ, the spot where he's going to come across. Where Elijah leaves the land and Elisha goes back into the land by smiting the Jordan and an opening up, that's going to be the spot. He's going to come right back across there. And verse 4 says, His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. That's where he's going to wind up. And you'll see that when he does, the mountain splits open and the topography of the territory has changed. And verse number 9, it says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. He's going to come back, Revelation says, and be king of kings and lord of lords. Now look one, one other passage, Zechariah chapter 1 while you're there. The army of heaven comes behind him and he goes out and leads the charge and he winds up red garment stained from head to foot. 
Zechariah chapter 1. In Zechariah, you get a series of visions that Zechariah gets about that day, about the conclusion of the fifth course of judgment on Israel, which is taking place there in the second advent. Zechariah 1 verse, well, verse number 8. And I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. Now the man is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 11, they answered, uh, he asked, what are these? And, and, and they answered that, they, they, uh, and they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and, and said, we, we go forth and so on and so forth. Obviously, the man in verse 8 is Christ. But when Zachariah sees him, he's not on a white horse anymore. It's a red horse. Can you understand how that horse would be red now instead of white? Folks, if he's on the white horse and he comes out, and, and when he gets to the end, his, his clothes are covered with blood, what's happened to the horse? It got it first. It's covered. This red horse here, here he is after the judgments. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. And behold, and I'm sorry, and behind him, what's behind him? The armies of heaven were, were there red horses, speckled and white. You know what happens? He gets red from head to foot. The next bunch behind him, they get the after spray of it. And the ones behind them, well, they don't get covered. So you've got red ones right behind him that are just as bloody as he is because they're getting the dose splashed right out of the can from him. The next ones get a little less. And the further back in the ranks you go, the less of the spray there is. So there's red ones, speckled ones, and finally white ones. Then said I, O Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And he goes on to describe the thing as being what we're reading over in Revelation 19. So when you come back over there now, what we have in Revelation 19 is the actual execution of the vengeance and wrath of God in the coming of Christ back to the planet to destroy his enemies and the day of vengeance and wrath of Almighty God. Now you know something folks, that's something you don't want to be a part of. You see all that bloodshed over there and that bloodshed and the bloodshed and the bloodshed and the bloodshed. I remember that Jesus Christ went to Calvary and shed his blood the blood of God because he was God and he died and shed his blood for you and for me that we don't have to shed our blood over there everything you and I deserve to get over there he took for us at Calvary yeah. that ought to make you appreciate what he did at the cross there are three times in this Bible when the wrath of God is poured out without mixture one is the second advent. One is the lake of fire. And one is Calvary. And thank God for that. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness and your grace to us. And we just say thank you for your love. And thank you for Calvary. We pray.